This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 97. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak. I'm Brian Deemer. I'm Jamie Dean. I'm Matt. I'm Kevin Moyer. I'm Peter Rios. We are sexy bitches, yeah! <laughs> and welcome to the show. Hey guys. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Devil's Due Publishing. Devil's Due Publishing proudly announces how to, how to self-publish comics, not just create them, a new four-issue limited series detailing the pivotal ingredients any young upstart would need to begin self-publishing in the medium of comic books based on Josh Blaylock's own decade-long experiences, from small press exhibitor to owner of a top ten comic company, plus the chance to self-publish a book with consulting assistance by Blay- Blaylock himself. Check out the contest details in the book. Um, he says, this is how I finally put all my experience to good use, to create something that can truly help the aspiring self-publisher and anyone who simply desires to expand their understanding of the business side of comics and manga. He continues, see if my tooling around in this industry for a decade can help you get a jump start into the business and learn from the success I've had and mistakes I've made. It hits comics uh, comics and specialty stores in February 2006 and monthly after. For more information, you can go to devilsdo.net or to the newly relaunched joshblaylock.com for con- contest information and latest updates from the author. Devil's Do, reminding everyone that pop culture is our culture. Thank you, Peter. A uh, quick reminder that uh, our book of the month uh, for January is Aranya, Heart of the Spider, Volume 1 Digest. Uh, get it at instocktrades.com for 40% off. And we also have two contests going on in January, and for all their details, you can check out our website. And coming up, we have an interview with Charlie Houston, who is uh, a novelist as well as the writer of the upcoming Moon Knight series for Marvel. So, welcome, Charlie. Charlie? Yes. All right, welcome to the show. With Thank me you. is Matt, Kevin, and Peter. Okay, hey guys. Hey, Charlie. Go hey, on. how you doing? So, so, the first question that we always ask everyone is, when did you first start reading comics? Uh, well, you know, I read them when I was a little kid. Uh, uh, you know, I, we, we did a lot of little kid comics, so I, I, I have vivid memories of some Scrooge McDucks from back then that, that uh, played a profound influence in my style. Uh, and then uh, I had a, just a handful of superhero comics around, uh, but some real choice ones. Some somewhere back in my uh, in my childhood, I had the very first appearance of Punisher, and uh, and I, I'm it, I cut it up and I cut the pictures out of it and I pasted them up and stuff and just utterly demolished it. And uh, I was I was really high on Ghost Rider when I was a little kid, but we didn't really uh, we just kind of go to the the grocery store and whatever was on the stand, uh, and, and sometimes those plastic three packs that they used to have and you'd get uh uh three comics for like 35 cents or something like that and uh and then i didn't really get into superhero comics until i i guess i was probably around 13 or 14 and uh a buddy of mine i think the first thing i remember to him turning me on to was uh uh was claremont x-men and uh, I remember my first impression was he had this comic book, and I hadn't bought a comic book in years, and I looked at the cover, and it was like 60 cents or something. I was like, so is this a super special or, a, or an annual or something? He's like, no, no, that's just a comic book. I spoke, well, is it like a, is it a collector? I, no, no, it's just a regular comic book. I was blown away at the idea that a comic book can cost 60 cents, and of course now I'd love to pay 60 cents for a comic <laughs> yeah, book. Yeah, you and me both. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and the, fir- the first one that I remember really making, I think, I think very, I think he showed me the one that I really remember. That the comic books that really got me started, specific issues were the um, the X Men one was one forty one and one forty two, the Days of Future Past or or whatever, where the, the first time that they go to the future and you know try to show what the world is like when they exterminate the mutants and. Uh, and I think it was Avengers Annual 10 when uh, Carol Danvers loses her powers and they do the team up between the X-Men and the Avengers. And, and you know, my memories of comic books at that point, you know, part of the reason I hadn't gotten into them 
in a in a real even as a, as a small kid they just you know uh, somewhere about part of the reason I think I like the character like the Punisher was because it sounds feel grounded in the real world and uh, superheroes didn't for some reason just really didn't get into my head even when I was a little kid but then as a teenager you know with some of the the new stuff that was going on this, even though there was all these wild powers and everything it, it was obviously there was a whole thing going on where an effort to really try and ground it. And so from the Claremont stuff, uh, I got into uh, Frank Miller's Daredevil, and I think that uh, I think the first time I walked into a comic book shop uh, was within a month or two of the, the first time they killed Elektra, when, <laughs> when it actually meant something. <laughs> and, uh, and then, so of course, that was kind of in its prime, and I went back and read all of his stuff. And uh, and then I just kind of got and then and at the same time uh, somebody somebody turned me on to Jim Starlin and uh, it wasn't till years later I wasn't aware of Alan Moore until Watchmen and at that point I wasn't even really reading comics somebody somebody handed them to me out of the blue um, so there's a there's a, a longish version. <laughs> Are you serious about the Uncle Scrooge stuff? The, what's that? Are you serious about the Uncle Stru- Scrooge? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I was a little kid. I was a little kid, but I have this really clear uh, uh, memory of a particular Scrooge, Scrooge McDuck story where uh, they they go to the Yukon. He's going back to uh, his, his old gold mining days, and there's like a contest to find the, the largest nugget. And for some reason, he's hauling around. Uh, he's got a, a ship in a bottle made out of gold, and something happens and they end up having to give away different pieces of the ship to survive and then they get to the last piece and they're starving or something and they pound it down and they do a fake nugget or something. I can't remember if this is the nephew's user, if this is Scrooge McDuck. I don't know, man. Just, you know, the things that stick in your head, I have no fucking clue why Scrooge McDuck is in there. Has it had a profound effect on, uh, on, on what I write? I think that's dubious, but, <laughs> but he's in there for some reason. Well, it's a running joke on the show. That's why I asked. Uh, because what Scrooge McDuck is? Actually, it is. Yeah. Oh we... no, shit! I walked right into it. I <laughs> have no idea. What's the running? What's the running joke? We do a segment called Stump the Rios, and we have listeners who submit questions, and they try to stump my trivia knowledge. I guess you could say. And one right. day, one day, we came back from Baltimore Comic Con and got bla- I got blasted with three Scrooge McDuck questions, and I pretty much snapped on the show, <laughs> and you know, saying that they weren't valid or whatever but so ever since then you know i had a listener actually send me a, a, a trade of scrooge mcduck comics and so it's just ever since then it's just been kind of like a, a oh that's funny gig. that's yeah. funny i no, i no, i wasn't trying to smack you around or anything like that i wasn't trying to i had i had no idea that's just that's just the first comic book i can really you know and that's going back to when i'm like five or six years old i'm sure but that's the first comic book i can remember reading was that was either a richie rich or a scrooge mcduck or some some crap like that Maybe well, a scamp. Well, feel free to to bust on Peter from now on. Now that you <laughs> <Okay>. know. That. <laughs> so what? What now? What else you got? So um, some of the the comics that you you mentioned there that you read, it, it seems like it's perfectly in line to 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 steer you right into what you're going to be writing. Yeah, yeah, and and of course you know, and the book that I didn't mention, and the, the you know the obvious omission is uh, is Moon Knight. And that was it was right at the same time, and I the the when I got the job, I actually I, I you know and this is you know one of those moments you can always be proud of in your life when you call home to your mom and dad and you say, hey, remember those comic books that I put in bags and boxes and left with you guys so they wouldn't be traveling around the country with me? Well, I need you to send them to me because I was right; they are worth something. I'm going to get some money off of that. <laughs> and uh, so I had, I had them send out my, my old uh, Moon Knights, actually, so I could reread them. And my collection that uh, started at, I, I'm, uh, I think it was like issue 22, so fairly, fairly um, pretty late in Munch's uh, run. Uh, but I was able, I had a buddy that had everything, you know, had from issue one, uh, so I was able to go back and read all the back issues, and then that's where I started collecting. So I was lucky enough to actually be, you know, be buying them on the newsstand when he was still writing the series, and then you know to see things go horribly awry uh, after he after he split. But that was another book that I was I was really into, and um, 
in a in a in a way it was uh, uh, it, I'm, it, I'm sure it had as much impact as any of the other stuff because it was just a little darker. It was a little more complicated, um, and uh, and it was the first time I was ever uh, really challenged, you know, by comic book art where I was, you know, looking at the pictures themselves and it's like. Man, I don't know if I like this, but it's definitely doing something to me emotionally, um, and really had that, and and not just in comic book art. It was it was kind. It was one of the the, you know, this is. I mean, like I say, this when I'm like 13, 14, 15 years old at the most. I think so. This was definitely, you know, uh, seeing uh, Sienkiewicz's stuff was kind of you know challenging a lot of what I thought about what looked cool and what cool art was. Um, I'm sure we're going to get back to it. I, j- I just want a quick ask, and as a way to get uh, the listeners a little, uh, more familiar with you. Sure. Um, I read on one of your bios that uh, you were an actor and then a bartender in New York, and I have to imagine that really adds to your creativity. Well, I don't. I don't know. Uh, for, you know, well, for one thing, there's you know, being an actor and a bartender in New York is 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 not necessarily uh, obviously a a, a unique position to find oneself in it's, it's pretty it's pretty typical but yeah the, i mean the acting thing it's to to a certain extent uh or i don't know if it's the acting as as much as just having spent most of my creative you know life most of the art that i've been involved in 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 my life has uh has has been through the theater so it's it's not so uh i think that the 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 way that I, the actual specific style that I write in, where there's, which is very dialogue heavy, very, you know, light on, uh, on the adjectives and, you know, tends to describe the action and the scenes in very basic stripped, um, um, style it has a lot to do with being influenced by having spent a lot of time reading plays and, um, and thinking in those terms, and and most the the I, although I I wrote little stories and everything from when I was pretty darn young, uh, most of the big stuff that I had written, um, in, and I mean big just in terms of actual number of pages, not in terms of anybody actually being exposed to them. Um, most of the larger projects I had written before I actually started working on on a novel were plays and screenplays. So that was that kind of. I think spoke very much to to the style that I adopted when I started working. You know, trying to tell these stories in prose. Well, and um, certainly as far as characterization go, there's no bigger bullshitters than actors. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, being able to you know being able to lie is you know the I, I won't say the heart and soul of fiction, but you know, being you know being able to tell a convincing lie is you know a big part of the job, and being able to. Um, uh, you know, being able to you know create some kind of uh, even you know whether it's with superheroes or with you know criminals and and whatnot that I usually write about, uh, being able to create some kind of verisimilitude. So whether you know whether the the world is realistic or not isn't as necessary as the world being internally consistent and being whole and believable within itself. So yeah, all that stuff kind of plays a role in it, and it also you know just having a um, I, you know, I think it helps develop a sense of, of story and kind of having, you know, if you've played, if you've had a, I'm, and I'm, bull, you know, right now speaking of bullshitting, I'm just, this is just stuff that's coming off the top of my head. But it's possible that, you know, kind of that being, being an actor and being, you know, physically involved in storytelling and, you know, that kind of immersion stuff that you do, that that, that could help develop a strong sense of story or, or, or a stronger sense of story. Which then obviously, you know, just comes. And then if you really want to talk about bullshitting, you know, bartending is, you know, the, is the, the breeding ground for all bullshitting, both, you know, on both sides of the bar. You have to pretend like you actually want to be, be there doing the job and that you're having a good time. And at the same time, you're also being exposed to all the bullshit that's happening over on the other side of the bar and people hitting on people, people telling ridiculous stories that, you know, never happened and never would happen. And, you know, so that's a that's a real immersion course in bullshitting right there. <laughs> Charlie, getting back to uh, to the Moon Knight series, sure, with sure. you um, trying to, as you said, you know, after Munch and Sagevich left, basically everything went awry, which is ultimately true. 
trying to steer all that back into without ignoring all that continuity, is, is that, did you find very challenging to try to manifest all that into what you're putting into the book right now? Well, I don't, I, I mean, I, they, the folks at Marvel were, you know, from the, from they, before I actually pitched anything, when they, when we had just had kind of, you know, general discussions, and I just, all I had really given them was this idea of the character as, as I saw him, uh, and they'd, they'd gotten comfortable with the idea of having me pitch, because, uh, um, because they're very, I, I would imagine that uh, it gets very tricky um, dealing with, you know, getting to the point where you're with, ready to hear somebody's pitch and what people are expecting and what their expectations are. So they're very, they were very cautious in any case in, in my in my situation with before they were ready to, to hear a pitch, and I just assume that's part of their process. Or I may have just been given off crazy vibes, and they, they wanted to be, you know, careful with me. I don't know. They heard a whole Scrooge McDuck thing coming from me. <laughs> um so uh, uh, when I initially, though, what they said when they were ready to hear me pitch was that the character was pretty much wide open, that they were, they were ready to hear anything, that what they wanted was uh, to have Moon Knight uh, mixed back into the Marvel U. They wanted a character that was, you know, that other writers could pick up and adapt into their stories if they wanted to, but they, they wanted there to be kind of a, they wanted a story that brought him to a point of, at the end of which, you know, he was ready to play a part again. And they were, wanted to kind of stabilize the character, not just bring him, not just in terms of bring him back, but have a, have a you know, real clear identity of who the character was so that there weren't all these wildly different, you know, every time the character appears, when he appears once every three years, He's not a completely different character from from the last appearance. So, uh, so they mentioned specifically, you know, just kind of rattling things up. They were like, you know, you can do a complete reboot. You can redo the origin entirely. You can have a new guy, new character. You can have Mark Spector training somebody else to, you know, and they they kind of went on like that. But none of that stuff really appealed to me. Um, for one, it just sounded like way more work than I was really wanted to get into. And uh, more importantly to me was that, I, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a perfectly good and cool and interesting um, origin there with a lot of, you know, territory left to be covered um, because it, it, it was, you know, the, 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 the initial series was so short-lived. And... Um, and it also just would have—it just would have seemed wrong to me. It would have seemed—I I, didn't—I know that that's not the Moon Knight story that I would have wanted to read. I mean, if I'd gone into a comic book shop and saw that there was a new Moon Knight comic book and picked it up, and it was you know a, a brand new you know Moon Knight coming out of nowhere or Mark Spector training you know his teenage nephew that he lost years ago you know whatever blah 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 to be the new moon Knight, i would have been horribly disappointed and that would have been the story i wanted to read so um so after that things got fairly easy because it's you know it's four to it was initial idea was four to six issues and i uh so there's a limited amount of space and i knew that i wanted to work with the original I wanted to work with a with a story that came out of the original uh, origin and came came out of that as much of that continuity you know as possible. And I didn't catch that. What was that last bit there? <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, then it you know then you go well there's so you've got to encompass X amount of ex of uh, exposition for you know to refresh the minds of readers who haven't been exposed to Moon Knight in a long time, and you figure that the overwhelming majority of their reader of the readers, because of this character, how we're, the character we're dealing with, know less than squat about him, or or were maybe exposed to him in the uh, in the '90s with Mark Spector Moon Knight, so they have a very different idea of who the character is or might be. So that that starts eating up a lot of the pages that you have available. So then you know you really start have to kind of cherry pick what continuity you're going to embrace. So I, you know, I, I, after I read the stuff that I had already read when I was a kid, I went on eBay and I ordered all of the Mark Spector stuff, and I ordered the, I, I had to buy a 
pile of fucking West Coast Avengers, man, to get the ones <laughs> with Moon Knight in it. Well, let me tell you what. <laughs> Those were a task. Uh, that, that was some that's wild a, shit in there. That's an understatement, Troy. Yeah, they went, they went, they went haywire, man. Uh, I, I, you know, and I picked, I kept all the ones with Moon Knight in them. But when I was done, I had all these freaking West Coast Avengers. And my wife was working with a guy who's a big comic book fan, and uh, but he, you know, he doesn't, you know, he just buys the stuff once. But he, he, he wants anything. Me, I read them. The ones that I know I'm going to read again, I keep around. The ones that I know I'm not going to read, I. I tried to find a good home for him, and uh, I was not going to be reading these again. And uh, so I, you know, I said, Virginia, just take these to Tommy. And she came back the next day, and she said, you know, Tommy feels bad. He says uh, you should hang on to those. He said, he said those are going to be worth something. I was like, baby, tell tell Tommy they're all. (laughs) 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 There are books that appreciate in value, and there are books that just don't appreciate in value. (laughs) So. so I read all that stuff, and obviously, you know, uh, I mean, I know Kevin knows in detail what was going on back then. I don't know, you know, how, how well-versed you guys are and all of it, but there was, you know, I mean, there it was just all over the freaking map because aside from the fact that, you, you know, the, the writers were not as, as gifted, they were not, you know, as gifted as... as uh, as uh, Munch and, or, or as, as other many other writers, and they was every time a new writer came on, they were changing their the vision of the character. So every X number of issues, you know, they went through I think like maybe three, maybe four um, uh, main writers on uh, on Mark Spector. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, and uh, and with each writer, there was kind of a different different style, different interpretation of the character. So it's hard uh, to know what, you know, what can you use and what can you not. Some of those stories, as, as not to my taste as they may have been, and some of those stories were really not to my taste, um, still struck little chords in me of things that could be cool, things that could be cool jumping off places to do a kind of a revisionist, you know, version of it, or to, to take in that, take that continuity and put a little spin on it, and try, try and look at it at a different angle. So, um, so there are in the in the first six issues of, of the Moon Knight I'm working on. There, there's it is the primary continuity is all all Munch, you know, and uh, there are definitely things where I've taken some license. Uh, I've tried to go easy on that and not get out of hand. Um, and then there are a few places where I've given a definite tip of the hat to Fist of Khonshu and the Mark Spector both, uh, and even to the West Coast Avengers, where I've acknowledged those parts of his continuity and, uh, and, and you know, with the idea that there might be other stories to be told there that where you could take some of those things that, that were done with the character that didn't I didn't really enjoy, but that I would feel I don't like it when somebody comes onto a comic book and ignores what's happened just because they don't like it. You know? I I would like I like to see a writer that wants to try and work a little bit higher, harder and find a way to embrace what's come before and work it into their style and work it into their story and acknowledge it and not just pretend like it wasn't there. I congratulate you for that. Yeah. Well, don't congratulate me too early. <laughs> well, no, I'm just uh, mean on the, on the concept of, of acknowledging that you, you're not the only writer who ever lived, you know. Well, it's, it's well documented. There have been others. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I mean, with what you just said earlier about you know that Marvel said to you that you could have done anything, and and who's to say if they didn't pick you your pitch, they could have picked someone else's who would have taken one of those other approaches. Oh well, I mean, there's no doubt if they had heard a pitch that you know had Moon Knight as the Herald of Galactus that they liked, they would have you know they would have done it. Um, you know, <laughs> making me cry. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually yeah. that's Shut actually up. something a friend of mine said to me when I told him <laughs> when I told him I was going to be I was going to be pitching a Moon Knight story. He was like, "Dude, 
Moon Knight is the Herald of Galactus. <laughs> and I was like, and I mean, and, and for, there was this one beat there when I was like, wow. And I kind of had a vision in my mind of <laughs> Moon Knight manifesting the power cosmic. I was like, that could, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Moon Knight is the Herald of Galactus. <laughs> you can always bring back the armor if, then. If I ever get to do a what if, Moon Knight is the Herald of Galactus. There you go. There you go. And his best friend can be Speedball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the inevitable Speedball reference, without a doubt. Somebody's <laughs> got to have him. What else you guys got? Uh, we have a it's the mile long, I'm sure. <laughs> Charlie, okay. I can talk to you for 12 hours, you know that. But. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the one, I can't say enough, I mean, and I've expressed it to you, and, and of course these guys know it as well. I couldn't have been more enthused to hear the things you had to say in the interviews that you uh, previously had partaken in that uh, being well versed and appreciative and understanding of what Munch had established with the character, whereas the other writers that came on afterwards, uh, you lost more and more as each interpretation came out and every creative team that came on the book. Granted, there were little windows of time where right. you know there was things that kind of were, hey, that's kind of neat, you know, I, I can dig this, you know, but it seemed to me that they really lost the grasp and essence of what is really makes the character unique and dynamic and make him different. And, yeah. and and to me, especially with you know the Chuck Dixon and the Mark Spector Moon Knight and the Marvel Knight stuff is where it was more prevalent than ever that the whole comparison of you know Marvel's Batman was so more prevalent and, and could right. really understand that, you know, this is where this people is can what? really dig it, you know. Yeah. I actually thought that the Chuck Dixon stuff was a kind of a weird cross between Iron Man and Doctor Strange. It was, you know, uh, the once once he got heavy into the the armor and the gadgets and the tunnels under the it just it yeah. seemed it was so weapons heavy and you know technology heavy and stuff and I was I was feeling like a total Tony Stark vibe coming off of the book at that point. And I didn't know I actually had a at an early thought um when I was kind of trying to, you know, and I was, because I, had, like I said, I had never read the Mark Spector stuff when I was first pitching, and I had had an early thought about doing, kind of doing something like that, doing kind of a techno Moon Knight. And I had the been armor thinking, <laughs> Well, I'd been thinking about, like, I had been thinking about uh, uh, nano armor, and I had had this, you know, this kind of vision of a, you know, of something that still looks like a superhero outfit, but mm-hmm. it's, you know, and all of this. And then I started reading the, uh, the Mark Spectors, and I was like, oh, well, Clearly, I have to stay as far away from, from that kind of stuff as I possibly can because it's been, it's been, it's somebody's given it a shot and it just didn't work out that well. So, you know, I decided it was best to stay away from that. I have to, you, you know, we've been talking about this, you and I, and, 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 sure. and to bring it up, I mean, to, you know, let's, 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 let's do let's, it. Let's do let's it. Get into it. <laughs> I mean, you have always established, you know, with the, with the background you've been aware of and what you appreciate as a character is the Munch and Sienkiewicz. And, You've expressed in interviews and even on your own website about bringing back the, the jet and silver costume, and now I see that you removed that from your website, and <laughs> you've expressed to me <laughs> some going well, on. I, well, let's let's start with just the the reference on 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 my website. I I never I I never occurred to me that. Uh, uh, that 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 would be so profoundly important to anyone, Kevin, and uh, I, uh, I I didn't I when I wrote it I wrote it in a rather I was just writing it because I remember you know because I know that Moon Knight is often not often but was sometimes referred to in the in the captions as the Silver and Jet or the Jet and Silver Avenger, but I at the time that I wrote it I really wasn't thinking about it that much, so. For the, you know what we should do is we should make make sure it's clear to the uh, to anybody who listens to this thing what we're really what we're talking about, sure. which is the um, uh, the Moon Knight's costume and the color scheme for for Moon Knight's costume. This is another okay. running gag on our show. Okay, so, which is so much the, more the, the people probably do know. <laughs> yeah, which is much deeper than the Scrooge McDuck than thing. Than the trust Scrooge me. McDuck. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> you don't know uh, how often I get ribbed, you know, and it's and I take it with stride. I enjoy it. You sure. know, it's it's fun that you know that. I can laugh at myself just as much as anybody else can, but it is well, something but, that, you know, when, when you came on to the, and was announced as the writer for the book, and the things that you were stating in your interviews, it really made me enthusiastic, because it's like, finally I get to read a good Moon Knight book like what I was used to reading, right. and, and I looked at it as an opportunity to, you know, to finally clear things up, you know, this is like, this is a starting point, this is another chance, an opportunity that, 
you know, these, there's so many vague and misconstrued uh, views of Moon Knight. And, of course, the costume was one that I, you know, was something prevalent for me, and a lot of people just never took uh, much note to it at all. And right. I just thought, you know, this is a time where, you know, this is, you're capturing what you, what you had set out as far as what you plan on capturing with the book and the character and such is basically um, uh, similar to what I was used to reading and what I was very enthusiastic about with the character. So right. seeing this all coming back to fruition and, and having uh, that enthusiasm and attention drawn to the character, I thought, well, this is a perfect time to clear up this costume thing as well. Sure. Because, because most people never knew. They didn't read. You know, I think it, it was after the first issue of Fist of Conchu, it was never referred to as silver right. or anything. You know, it was just, this is how it is. Well, I think there. Well, let's, so let's just talk about this. So that uh, for the folks that are listening who 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 know uh, uh, who who know this from the from the show or don't know it from the show, Kevin Kevin is uh, a big fan of the silver and jet and the and the whole and the and the the whole concept of getting liter- getting Moon Knight literally into silver and jet. And Moon Knight has always been portrayed whatever the costume was referred to. In the bubbles, the way he's always been drawn is in white or in black and white, and uh, there's there's never really been any kind of a of an of a serious effort, even in the original run of the book when you know uh, 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 when uh, excuse me when Munch was was doing it to you know make the, the costume actually look silver. Which you know, um, when we interviewed Doug, he he specifically stated that that he had told the colorist not to color him anything at all, irregardless of the limitations of the four-color process. Right. So right. so he had said not to use any color at all. Right. Okay. Uh, well, here's here's kind of the, the uh, to the extent that I have any thinking, so we'll, we'll just talk a little bit about the costume. So all trying to draw this out of continuity or, or whatever, to me, it's, it's almost, it, to me, that's like an open page, because you figure... In the original conception of the character, in the character's first appearances in Werewolf by Night, the costume is given to Mark Spector uh, to buy the committee, and it's it's the whole reason that it's silver is so that he'll be more effective fighting their werewolf. Right. And then once the character gets its own book, they they do a revision of the history, and we find out that uh, that. Suppose that Frenchie is supposed to have, you know, played a role in, in suggesting to the committee that this is the costume that Moon Knight should wear, or or so having planted the idea, um, because we now we know by then that that Spectre actually got his idea for the costume because it, he's trying to make himself look like Conchu. Um Which he so, did get the in the min, in the Munch retelling of the origin, he got the the cape and. Hood from the the actual right. statue from of right. Gretchen from the, the actual statue, yeah. um, and uh, so but but you know as as we've already kind of talked about continuity kind of ebbs and flows a bit and you try to catch it and you try to take it pretty seriously but there's already you know some some sketchiness in the continuity now I'll admit freely admit that the part, you know I I didn't really like I say until you got in touch with me I'd never even occurred to me. Even though I referred to him on the website as being in Silver and Jet, like I said, that was just kind of like a cool, you know, reference I was using. I wasn't thinking about it literally at all. And it had never occurred to me to think about it literally because regardless of what any characters said or anybody referred to Moon Knight or the captions referred to Moon Knight in the comic books about him being in Silver, dude was in white, you know, when you actually looked him on the page. And if anything, when I was a teenager... I was kind of irritated by that by that disconnect, and I'd be like, I can remember the, I can remember a couple times where it'd be like they referred to him being in silver. I'd be like, he's not in silver, he's in white. Um, and so I just have to say, in in my mind, that's how I've always pictured him is just being in white, you know. And part of this is, you know, there's also just an issue of of aesthetics, and and you know. I have no problem with that. I know that there are people that are just like, uh, you know, don't, you know, think it looks silly. I don't, man. I I think it looks cool. I like it. I, I've always liked it, and uh, and it never it never really bothered me. So, but 
I also, you know, totally uh, knew going in. So this is, you know, it, it, I think all of this is just stuff that was just kind of randomly jumbling around my head. And um, so when I started re- writing the, the book, um, I just, you know, I didn't even think about silver. It wasn't on my mind at all. And uh, I was just thinking white. And I was thinking, well, you know, why do you, you know, why do you wear white? You know, why do you wear, you know, why do you run around at night wearing white? And, uh, and I was also thinking about uh, the character and, and who, the, who the guy is and uh, who Mark Spector is and, and what he does when he puts on a costume and, and what, you know, what is the nature of his job as a, as a costume, as a, as a guy in a costume. And um, what I kind of, what I came to and something that, I, that is actually in the comic book and addressed in the comic book is, uh, or in, in the script and, and will be in the comic book, is that uh, the reason you wear white is because you're not sneaky, is because you're not a detective. It's because you're not a hero and you're not saving lives. You're, you are a spirit of vengeance. You're a former heavyweight boxer and mercenary for hire. And what you do is you fuck people up, and you want them to be scared shitless of you. And anybody can run around sneaking around in black at night, but it takes a real hard ass to come flying out of the bottom of a helicopter wearing white and drop down onto some motherfuckers and beat the shit out of them. And uh, when I kind of hit on that idea, I liked it a lot. And it, it spoke to everything that I was already thinking about the character. And, uh, and it became something that actually, that it, not just as background in my brain, but it became something that was on the page and stated on the page. So that's kind of, that's where I was with it. And uh, um, just... Uh, you know, he's in white, and that's, that's it, and that's the end of the story. Now, um, we had an email exchange where I, uh, Kevin and I did, where I mentioned to him, you know, hey, this is, you know, let's, 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 let's get you ready for this early so, you're, so you don't get it when you pick up the first issue. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going white with the, co- with the costume. And, uh, and Kevin was disappointed, and he, and he actually brought up, uh, he showed me, he sent me a, scan of a uh, article from Wizard that had um, part of one of uh, Finch's um, one of the, some of one of some of the work that will actually be in the first issue and showed me and showed me the color because I hadn't seen it uh, I hadn't seen that uh, issue of Wizard and Kevin you said you liked the coloring in that am I right yes I did okay now I'll be perfectly honest at this point um, I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> well, see, and, and you know, and that's why when you know when I started exchanging emails, you know, again with you when we got reconnected after your computer lapse, you know that, right? You know that when we started addressing this, that uh, it, it, I always understood you as understanding that and taking that as part of you know, of, you know, of the character, you know, being essence of the character, having some sort of, of significance with the character. Well, I, to me, the, the the color of the co- I mean, in, it, I don't know what the significance is of you know silver and black in terms of in, informing. You know, to me that might look cool, but I don't. To me, there was whereas I was able to to find a real visceral connection to the idea of this guy, you know, going out and being a nighttime Avenger and dressing in white, right. and that making sense to me in terms of the kind of person he is and what he does. Um, whereas there's, you know, I don't have any similar rationale for silver and black. But I also, you know, I don't, uh, but I'm also like a really flexible guy. So the truth is I've, I've pretty much, you know, left this in the hands of, uh, of the people who actually draw and color things and are, you know, better at, at visuals than I am. Right. Um, and because I've got different ways to, in terms of the script, I've got different ways that I can approach it. So, like I say, I'll be honest. When you when you sent me that scan with uh, that, you said you liked the coloring. Yeah. The color looked darker than the colors that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but uh, but that may have been the quality of the scan, or it may have been the production reproduction right. in Wizard. Sure. The colors that I've seen are, you know, uh, it's, they're, they've got, it's definitely lighter and uh, not so much of a dark pewter shade. It's, you know, it's much closer to white, but there's a definite sheen to it. But they're also, you know, all the colors that I've seen are all taking place in these nighttime scenes and in lightning storms and, right. you know, I, without seeing the whole thing, I don't, I don't know for sure. So, uh, you know, Finch and I only, only communicate uh, uh, occasionally, so I haven't really had a chance to, to ask them what their, what their final look is going to be. Uh, and when they let me know if they've, if, uh, if Finch and his team have gotten together and they've, you know, they've said, you know what, with, with the visuals, we can make this look much cooler by going with the, with the, the silver thing, then all, uh, all, you know, I can fit that in, you know, and I can make that work. Um, but in terms of, we'd also talked in, uh, in emails about, uh, about what was behind the idea. And, you know, so, so starting from first, from just the place where white is just what I envisioned, uh, and then going to the place where once I started really thinking about that, of, uh, you know, really liking the idea that, that he's not about trying to hide himself. And he's about, you know, he's about being out there and terrifying people and uh, looking, you know, he, and, and honoring the moon, which, you know, to me looks white, not silver. So that's, kind of, that's where I'm coming from with it. But as I say, I don't know as of this moment what the final, re, what the final look is going to be. It's still, you know, it still seems to be evolving with the guys doing the art. Right. I know, you know, the question, and see, that's one thing that I felt when you, the last time you emailed me that was kind of a mis- misunderstanding is that it's not so much, I mean, it is partial that, you know, we don't have the restrictions like we did years ago with the color restrictions that we Sure, you know. sure. So... It is kind of important in the sense that it looks that way, but to me it was more to the point of how it's interpreted, and that's where Doug Munch had made it a point to interpret it that way, so it came across, you know, they could, they didn't have the options where, you know, is what we have nowadays, so he made it a point in every issue to point that out to the readers so that they knew what they were looking at, even though, you know, they're looking at nothing, basically a blank, right. you know, blank area. Um so that's why when I express to you is like, you know, is this something that you're going to put into and you're going to make it a point to address or is it just something that you're not even bothering to address in the issue, as so to speak, as in that in that same rationale as far as you're writing here? You're, you're not going to it'll address be, it? It'll be, no, I'm, like I say, as I, as I just said, the, you know, I already, the scripts as written address the costume as white. Uh, and it's and it's explicitly you know referred to as white, and the the rationale while it is is given in the course of action, but it's you know what's behind it is very much what I've just told you, which is that a guy who you know who's who's calling is to go out into the world and find people that are doing bad things and make them pay for doing bad things in, you know, to avenge the people to whom bad things have have been done doesn't, you know, doesn't look to hide himself. A guy who is a heavyweight boxer who walked into a ring not thinking to himself, I'm a skippy, dodgy, fly white, I'm I'm a heavyweight boxer. I'm a person that goes into a ring and walks up to the other fighter and starts trading body blows a guy who gets kicked out of the service for punching an officer a guy who goes and sells his service to kill other human beings i don't think is you know who is and and who is already who is clearly just crazy anyway uh uh by the time he's you know by the time he's doing this stuff and has you know split his personality in pieces so that he can cope with the world uh, and you, you know, uh, I I think arguably just has a, a huge death wish. Uh, doesn't you know? I don't think he's thinking too much about uh, about a costume that might help him to blend into the night or anything like that. I think he's thinking about, like I say, scaring people. Uh, and and you know, he wants them to see him coming, and he wants them to pee their pants before he gets there. Um, and that's. You know, so that's my approach. Um, I have an alternate approach that embraces the costume being silver. Um, 
and uh, and as I say, if uh, if Finch and the boys uh, come to me and and once we sort this all out and they say, you know what, it's just going to look so much better, and we're going to be able to do so much more if we go with the silver hues. Then you know I'm I'm going to bow to their artistic judgment. Um, but this is you know. Like I say, this is just this is this is where it is. But I know one of the things we had talked about was what's the you know what's the thinking behind what how do you you know how do you explain the costume being white uh, and that's that's my explanation. And and that's cool. And I can you know I can see where you're coming from, and I can see um, what you're setting out with the character as far as what I've read is you know where you're taking the direction of the character and right. such, which you know I totally understand and totally you know can comprehend where you're coming from. I just, uh, to, to add on what you had already expressed, it's exactly what you had said to me earlier in an email back in like August or September when we were, you know, exchanging and talking about things like this. And you said that you um, would, if it were up to you, you, you would prefer the silver and black, but it's not really your call. Yeah. You know, that's up well, to the art team. You know, and you know what? That was, that was, that was said loosely. And, and if I had been thinking, if, I had, if the process had been further along by then, I would have already known that that's not what I wanted to do. At that point, like going in initially, I think, you know, I liked the idea of, you know, of, of realizing the character as it had been described. And then once I actually got into the nuts and bolts of writing and once, and also at that point, it, I had had an initial discussion with Finch about color. And, you know, to tell you the, the truth, the, the, in the first discussion we had, we talked about, I talked about silver and black. And uh, I said, you know, can we, what do you think, will this work? And he'd been very, you know, mm, I don't know. And I said, well, you guys, you guys, if you guys can at least maybe try it and take a look at it and see how it looks, I would appreciate that. And, uh, and the way, you know, the way this process works, I'm sure, you know, is, you know, very, Finch lives in Canada, right. you know, so we bounce an email once in a while and, and that's, you know, that's about it. We've talked on the phone a couple of times and I get pages and I love his pages and every now and then he asks me if I can, if he can have a little leeway on something and I'm, you know, like I, I, so far I've been happy to say, this this here is really important to me. Everything else on that page is wide open, you know. Sure. Um, but uh, but that that was kind of the, the what we, when we came out of that first conversation, the impression that I got, without it ever having been explicitly stated, mm -hmm. was that silver and black was probably not going to work. That it was that it was not going to uh, necessarily play to the strengths that they were working from. That, yeah. the, that the artists were working from. And, uh, and I was like, okay, well, cool. I said, and, I, and I said, you can give it a shot. But I walked away from that and uh, thinking that, okay, well, we're going white. And that's when I really started thinking hard about what it would mean for the character to be in white. And once I got my mind in there, it became something that I became very attached to. And then, as I say, the, the artwork that I've seen has seemed to play to that but then, you know, I've seen this other image uh, that you shared with me, and, uh, and I've also looked back at the, to the stuff that I have that's colored, and, you know, like I say, it's hard to, because of where the scenes are taking place, it's, it's hard to be absolutely certain what effect the guys are, uh, are going for once you start thinking about it. Uh, I think it's very possible that what's, uh, as I think I said in an email to you, one man's white is another man's silver. Sure. If they're if 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 they're using the the effects that I've seen on on the work that I have on my laptop, which is you know has crappy graphics, uh, you know I, I you know it's entirely possible I'm looking at something that's going to look very different yeah. when I see it on paper. So uh, I, I, I mean, I obviously I don't feel nearly as strongly about this one way or another as you do. I have this very clear idea in my mind now about the costume being white. But as I've said, I'm not going to you know if it if it if the guys have an, have something that looks better, then I'm going to go with what looks better in this situation because I can play it both ways. Um, and that's you know, and I'm happy with that. It's much more important to me. To be, you know, to to be true to to the character as 
guys would say, I wasn't going to say it as a person, but that's bullshit. To be true to the to what I think is the nature of the character. To me, having the character in white is is a manifestation of, of who I think he is. Um, but I can, like I say, I I've got a I've got an alternate, you know, uh, costume. Uh, you know, there's like three or four bits of dialogue that I'll, I'll have to alter. Uh, and at some point, you know, I'll before the first issue comes out, I'll have to have the definitive conversation and all uh, with the boys, and and they'll say to me, "Well, Charlie, here's your costume," and I'll say, "Okay, well, that's great," you know, because whatever whatever it is. You know, uh, I mean, the the work that they're doing is just fucking awesome and 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 far cooler than uh, anything I could have hoped for. So, well, um, I, I, hang on just a second. Go ahead. I'm, I've already gone uh, over time, so I just want to give you a warning. I've I got I can give you 15 more minutes, so we should if you stuff that's other priority stuff, we should move to it. What's higher priority than <laughs> so? <laughs> I just no, I, I mean. I, you know, I, I I did talk to Finch about this myself after I spoke with you about it. When you given me the reply, where I was going with what I was saying before is that you said you know you would prefer silver and black, but it's right. up to the art team. You know, that's where you left it with me back then. Right. So I thought, well, you know, I'll talk to Finch then and see what he has to say about it. Right. And he put it back to me, and he said, well, if it'll make you feel any better, we're working on how to color him more appropriately silver. It's a challenge to get it right, though. I didn't right. want to go with the black outfit. It's just a preference visually. Right. Now that. Oh yeah. No. Never. Never black. Never black. See, and that's black. Black was never an option. And that. And that's fine. You know. And I. I looked at it. See, I never embraced the black costume after I read that article with Sinkevich and that whole determination behind it all. But the only thing I can say at this point, you know, it's I. I agree with you. That the most important thing is capturing the essence of the character. Right. You know, talking about the color of the costume is just something that I felt. To take advantage of the internet and using, utilizing as a tool, use, utilizing what can be done to express is to get some clarification and, and, and forget the, the ignorance and the confusion that has been transpiring for a while. But for myself, is you know, it's not something that's so trivial, and it's just something that I'm just trying to, to make a point to be an ass sure. about. It's me. It's there is a significance for the costume to be silver, and it's not so much just because it was to fight a werewolf. Um, I also look at it that. A costume has something to represent as far as the character is. Just like you said, it, you know, white you know, represents the fact that he just doesn't care who sees him and what, right. where he's coming from. And I agree with that. And I look at the silver costume and go that you can have that same silver, similar effect. And he's already had this silver costume because that's part of his origin and that has already been established. Um, but it adds such a stylist and, myst- and, a, and a mystical look to him, which adds and is also a reflection of some of the elements that make him unique and truly dynamic and unique in his own as a character himself so you know i look at other characters like daredevil you know when you see him in the yellow and and red or black whatever it was in the beginning and you see him in the red outfit you you don't get the same feel of the character you see what i'm saying sure you know and and it's prevalent with other characters same thing with the punisher you know you and i grew up looking at the punisher as being blue and now you see him and he's black with this white thing and and it looks so striking and dynamic and it adds an element to the character but it's also a reflection of the character and I look at Moon Knight as the same type of situation whereas you know he's kind of this you know the ambiguity of the spirit of Khonshu is he a you know a spirit of Khonshu is he this you know avatar of the moon so to speak the 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 one taking revenge and and, uh, doing the deeds of Khonshu or is this is his own manifestation you know mentally and but I think whether it's the black or the silver costume, it adds that element of mysticism to it and adds that kind of spiritual aspect to it. And it also makes him look very dramatic and dynamic. And I think looking at Moon Knight as being a character in itself in a comic is unique in himself. I think one of the reasons why I like him is because there's not really another character out there that I feel is like him. And to keep him set apart from other things, you know, from other characters and such... The costume helps add to that, you know, helps give that him another a look. Because, you know, to myself, I look at comics and I think, who else has a silver costume? You know, obviously, other than Silver Surfer, which isn't a costume, but nobody, you know. And I thought, this is something that helps him stand apart. It's a reflection of him and his himself, and it also kind of adds to some of the elements that make him unique. So that's my understanding, and that's where I come from with it. Okay. So where... What I'm confused about is where does this number one issue take place? 2006, after all this continuity, or is this, as you said, 
a reimagining sort it, of like it, what they're the, doing the with the story. Black the story will be taking place 2006, you know, give or take, because there's, you know, uh, you know, you know how I the the shuffling of dates and everything. Right. You know, there's never if you, if you were to try and read every title across, you know, the Marvel line, there would be contradictions between what's happening, and you know, it's just endless. But yeah, it's it's meant to be contemporary. Um, uh, it's meant to be after you know after all the the previous um, uh, continuity. It. I'm trying to think of continuity that it directly flies in the face of. It probably flies in the face of some of the Marvel Knight stuff, which I didn't really read that extensively. I think with the Marvel Knight stuff, I had finally hit my limit, and I stood in a comic book shop and read a couple of them in the used bin and put them back. And uh, uh, and then it, it comes out of the jumping-off place for it, the, it is uh, will have been something that happened in the interim between Marvel Knights and when this starts. Well, that my, kind of the incite the inciting event that has put him where he is, right, and then it will be covered in the course of the of the first six issues. My question, I guess, I, what I was trying to nail down is, you know, this discussion about the costume is sure, sure. Is this something that now he's wearing a white costume, or is oh, it that you know it's what? I, you know what? I hadn't. I frankly, I, I wasn't. Yeah, I was just going to basically. My part of my other thinking was that, with with rare exceptions of people like Kevin and myself, nobody knows that the costume's supposed to be silver. Nobody thinks of the costume as silver. People think of it as white. People refer to it as white. You know that is that is kind of the pop the popular conception of Moon Knight is a guy that runs around in white, not just uh, uh, in uh, uh, not just among comic book readers. Uh, but uh, within you know within the comic books themselves, you know there are, there are lots of references within a lot of these comic books of people seeing him, and you know uh, talking about you know how ghostly and white he is. Uh, so yeah, I you know I was not I had I I depending on how it goes, uh, what we end up with, it's I'm you know this is this this will yes indeed if we end up going with the white costume it will absolutely abuse the continuity and it might be something that i go back and address at some point but as of now it's not really you know it's it's not addressed so i i'm sure that um kevin will not be alone in uh um uh having something to say on that one because yeah i didn't you know i i i thought of it as uh when i was writing that first script that was the one thing where i was and once again, I didn't even really think about it that uh, consciously, where it was just seemed so basic to the character at this point that uh, that there's there are only a few of us that uh, are left alive at this point that remember, you know, that the costume was supposed meant to be, you know, silver in the first place. The only thing that I had to say, you know, in, in, in that aspect of which is another reason why I thought there was some importance behind it was because of them releasing the essentials of right. Moon Knight. And I thought, well, now these people that didn't read the Munch Sienkiewicz stuff, that only were familiar with the character from Mark Spector or possibly West Coast Avengers, will pick up the essentials, and which has no color in it whatsoever. So right. if they read it and now go back and read it, you know, now it's it's canon and it's actually, you know, Stipulated in every issue, whether it's dialogue, right. narrative, or whatever, and that you know, then they're going to be like, "Well, wait a minute, what's up with this?" You know, and that's why I thought. Well, I, you know, I don't know how much concern there is. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that. Um, I, I mean, to me, that's not a particular concern. I mean, I don't know how many, how widely essentials sell. And Fifty I, billion I don't, copies. A billion, a billion <laughs> copies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not particularly concerned about, you know, uh, the smoking gun website coming out with an expose and, and saying, you know, the, the, the essentials, the costume is clearly referred to as being silver, and in Charlie Houston's new miniseries, it's white, and he's not addressed the continuity. Um, I am concerned. I am concerned with trying to, to, to having a rationale. I am concerned with 
having a reason, you know, for for him wearing what he wears. And, and but for a lot of my thinking is, is, is you know about that is just anybody who dresses up in a costume and does something, I want there, you know, I there to be some rationale for why they're doing that and, and why it's that particular costume. Um, and uh, so I, you know, that's that's where I'm going with it right now. But um, do you guys have anything else you want to get onto? Because I, I just got a few more minutes here, and I don't know if we want to. If there's much more here, yeah. I don't. I'm. I. I just don't know if I have anything else to add to it at this I point. Think, no, I think we've fine. exhausted that. Completely. Yeah, we just. Yeah. You know, just to clarify, so we understand. Sure, sure. And that's cool. So I, yeah, I, this is Matt. I have. Uh, I've been a Moon Knight fan for years myself, and um, I just have a question from the stuff that I've been reading that seems so. The Moon Knight you're going to be riding is going to be uh, pretty hardcore with the, the brutality. And it seems just kind of what I seems to be implied, a little bit different from what I, I read before. With your series, is this kind of where he is right now? He's kind of going back to the way his mercenary days and is a little bit more hardcore as he gets older? Uh, yeah, and there, 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 a lot of this will be fleshed out in the book. Um, I, I mean, that part of it is just that's how I read the character when I read the first, you know, the first stuff, you know, was that, you know, he doesn't want to be a killer anymore, and, and he wants to try and, you know, uh, redeem his past, but I always, you know, Moon Knight always read as a very violent character to me, and it was, you know, part of what was attractive about it was that this is kind of no old smart guy, and uh, and also the idea, once again, the idea that I was reading, you were reading a character who's, you know, a spirit of vengeance, you know, um, and so I, I, you know, there were places where it got, I, you know, it, uh, I don't remember who was writing it when they did this, but they reinterpreted the texts of Khonshu, and it turned out Khonshu was the god of justice, not of vengeance, and, you know, so he was, Moon Knight's mission changed, or whatever, uh, which is, you know, uh, which is just, was just silly, and it was, an, it was, Another one of those cases of somebody, you know, wanting to try and change their approach to the character and have him fight crime internationally and become, you know, kind of a 007 guy who is flying to different places to, you know, stop jewel thieves. Um, and that's, you know, that's not how I see him. Uh, he's not going to be toting around any machine guns or anything like that and, you know, throwing grenades into, into buildings. But it's, it's definitely... Uh, my concept of him is, is, is definitely just going in is a guy, is a human being who has a very violent nature. Uh, I also have this idea that of um, that you know of, of a guy who's as he gets older that um, the the options when you're in a fight become more limited and you know. Uh, being, you know, getting all daredevil and twisty, turny and dodgy and, you know, trying to knock people out becomes a little bit harder than just, you know, punching them as hard as you can until they fall down. Um, and, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, find ways to change what you do to, to suit becoming, uh, becoming older. Um, and there will also be um, some specific reasons that will kind of evolve over the course of the first six books for and and beyond for uh, why his particular brand of violence uh, is is necessary for him. Okay. How long are you on for the book? Just real quick. Uh, the we, we, the first. So I know I'm gonna. I've done the first six, and I know I'm gonna do six more, and that's all all we know for sure right now. Yeah, they, um, it's kind of confusing today. They released the solicitations, and it says one of six. You know, so it's still like, I yeah, I think that's just that. You know what? I just think that that's the I way. So. Yeah. yeah, that's just the way marketing and and uh, the communication between artistic and marketing and what have you. And that solicitation was probably written, you know, months ago, right. and uh, nobody bothered to go through and edit it. Uh, or either that, or or Marvel hasn't told me something. Uh, <laughs> well, let's hope not. Think it's, yeah, which I don't think is the case. No, I it, don't it sounds like it. it uh, I, I, I'm definitely. I, like I say, I'm gonna. I'm working on a novel right now, and and trying to to get to a comfortable place where I can take a break from it, and I'll get started on uh, the next story arc. And I I know already kind of 
uh, what where I know where I want to start it, and this this is actually will actually be kind of good good stuff to close on out, and, and we can do one 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 or two quick questions uh, off of this. The you know the with the first six when they thought it was going to be a mini, the whole you know the whole mission was get the character up on its feet by the end of the of the series have have him back in the game and have some clear a clear kind of you know the definition around the character so that other writers can can use him and so that he can circulate in the Marvel universe um, and in the course of that because of the way I approached it I also wanted to encompass a certain amount of continuity so that people kind of you know knew the old game and could see how the old game was going to you know fit in with the new game uh, and part of that also is involved reintegrating some of the characters from his uh, from his past who have been shed and readopted and shed and readopted by various writers over the years. So, uh, so the first six books, I was able to I, I what I hope I was able to do and what I was trying to do was bring him to a place where you've kind of got Moon Knight established in his world with his people and what he does. Very much separate uh, from from the MU without any real context. So one of the things I'll be trying to do through the next story arc, and I'm not sure exactly how many issues uh, it'll do. I know I'm going to do six more issues. I don't know how long the next arc will run. If it'll be all all six or shorter than that. Um, one of the things that I will be working on will be trying to to integrate him into the the larger Marvel universe. So I want to have him cross paths with some other Marvel characters, actual other actual superheroes from his past, without it being, you know, with trying to avoid the usual cliches of, you know, having their, having it be somehow rooted in the story for why he's seeing these people and talking to them, and and uh, not have it just be. Spider-Man, what are you doing here? Well, I was swinging through, and I saw this explosion, and I thought I'd... Um, so a lot of what I'll be doing, uh, aside from pursuing a... You know, I know the villain I, that I want to play with specifically, and I, I know the conflict I want to play with between the two of them. Beyond pursuing that kind of central trunk story, the stuff that's going to be going on around it is trying to put put Moon Knight in context with the rest of the Marvel Universe, because that's going to happen. Other writers, uh, you know, everybody has a, has a little crush on Moon Knight, understandably so, and other writers are going to want to use him. And I, one of the things I told Axel uh, when we first started talking about doing, well, at the time what we were talking about was doing a second mini, was that one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to have first, first shot at defining the character in terms of how he's seen by the general public and how other uh, how other costumed people see him uh, before other writers started bringing him into their books and, and, and defining him uh, themselves. And that's just me being greedy and, uh, and you know, wanting to, you know, wanting to kind of, you know, have, have a handle on that. And then uh, at that point, after, after I finish the next six issues, uh, I, it'll just everything will be entirely dependent on uh, what my schedule allows and whether or not Marvel is interested in, in having me write anymore. Um, because uh, uh, while it's nice that uh, I've, I've gotten some, some uh, real nice uh, emails from people like Kevin, and well, there's nobody like Kevin, but <laughs> I've gotten some real nice emails from, from other people, other, other dilettante Moon Knight fans, uh, uh, who, who uh, lack his passion. Um, I, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's no telling what the actual reaction will be. And um, there's no telling until people who actually read comic books pick up actual comic books and read them whether or not, uh, you know, there's going to be interested in it. So it could be that, um, that I do, you know, my 12 issues and, uh, and, and, you know, this goes on to Bendis' pile of what he does over the weekend when, you know, he's got another, you know, free five minutes. Um, and I don't mean to be hacking on, on Bendis. I just mean that he's, he seems to be capable of, you know, handling an infinite number of, of titles. So, you know. Anyway, so uh, let's, let's, we're, um, so coming off of that, two more questions and then, and then I, I got to go. 
I'd like to. I would speak. You just brought up Bendis, and I actually is on my list. I want to completely okay. switch gears. Sure. In one of your interviews, uh, you were presented with a, a, a discussion about how some people think Bendis is the king of decompression, and then there's other people, like myself included, who think that he doesn't waste a single word or a single panel. Right. And uh, you uh, seem to lean closer to my opinion than to the other opinion. And since you're a professional writer, I just thought I'd use you to help me uh, back up my opinion. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I, uh, uh, I was unaware that the debate existed uh, until I got this job and I started. So, you know, one of the things I did, obviously, was start looking at websites and reading discussions that were going on and getting an idea of the environment. And, and uh, uh, I was, you know, kind of curious, and I stumbled across compression versus decompression, and uh, 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 was able to kind of intuit from, from the, some of the stuff that was going back and forth what, what, what seemed to be the, the crux of the argument. I'm inclined to think that, uh, that it's, 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 the, the debate is, is that there's, there's, is not that I don't understand that how the debate exists in the first place. To me, there's either um, good storytelling that uses the available space effectively or bad storytelling that, that doesn't use the, the available space effectively. And if it takes you, you know, just because, of, you know, in the old days, you know, a story was told in one issue is now told in six issues, that doesn't mean that one issue was good. And it doesn't mean that six issues like that were good. What it meant more often than not in my experiences was that you had six you know, issues of that that were more than likely made very little sense, and you know, were just a lot of this pal and the occasional you know thought bubble. You know, why isn't Mary Jane talking to me? And Aunt May's going to be really pissed when I get home late. And uh, I, I, you know, I it, it you know, and I, I mean, nothing. I, I think there are a few things better than a tight cohesive, you know, comic book story that can be told in one issue. You know, like a great one-shot is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing, but I don't think that that means that there's something inherently wrong with someone spinning, you know, a story out over uh, several issues. And um, I think that one of the things that Bendis does really well that I, that I, I really admire about him is uh, how much information he can put into a single panel, uh, and I'm speaking of him as the writer and, and what you know what he chooses to emphasize in a panel and then have the artist execute for him. So obviously this is something that he does in, in concert with his with his artist. But uh, I'm inclined to agree. I I look at a Bendis comic book and I think there's very little wasted space. Uh, there may not be a, a tremendous amount of action. There may not be a huge leaps and bounds advance of the overall plot, but there will be so many intense singular moments, you know, and it can be something as, it can be an, uh, just a, one of those little raised eyebrow reaction things that he likes to do. Or it can just be the detail of, uh, a, you know, a physical, of, a, of an object in flight, you know, and, and that uh, one character is seeing but the other character isn't, so you have so you see what one character sees. You, as the reader, know that the bottle's coming at the back of the head of the other character, but the other character doesn't know it. And you know, those are it's uh, it's a very cinematic style, and uh, and I like it. You know, um, I you know I think a, 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 and so I I I don't you know I'm certainly I don't I look at Bendis and to me it, it's part of the reason that I have a problem with the debate is because the uh, the terms don't mean a lot to me. I look at Bendis, and I, and I, and I think I, I said this before, to me, his style, to me, almost feels compressed because he compresses so much information into these little frames, into these little simple pictures, and so much story, storytelling into, you know, a tiny event so that he may spend an entire page on something as opposed to spending the, you know, using six panels, you know, for a space battle, he may use those six panels for somebody, you know, walking from one side of the room to the other or something like that. But there's going to be a, an enormous amount of story being told in that character walking across uh, the room, which to me could be interpreted as 
you know, someone compressing story into little things. But, so the terms don't mean a whole lot to me. Certainly, uh, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, if you're in the broadest terms, if you were to, if, if someone who works in a, in a decompressed style is one that eats up a ton of space and wastes panels, uh, I don't, you know, I, I mean, there, there's any number of comic book writers, Bendis among them, where there are times where I would all look at a panel and I'll say, well, I don't know why that's there, but I certainly don't think that he's cavalier at all. Uh, I think he's very, very, his style seems to me like he thinks very hard about each panel, and each panel is very well, you know, is very um, uh, consciously crafted. Uh, it, I may not always agree with what he's done as, you know, just as a reader, uh, but I don't, you know, the idea that, that he just throws panels around and wastes time on craft that we don't need to see, I don't buy that at all. I don't buy that at all. Thank you so much. <laughs> you bet. Okay, one more. One more. I, I guess this is Jamie. I'll, I'll, I'll make this like the little ass kissing ending. Oh, please. Um, <laughs> I, rather than read a whole bunch of interviews about Moon Knight, when I really didn't care that much about Moon Knight, I thought I'd find out who Charlie Houston was by reading Charlie Houston. I got to tell you, I picked up Caught Stealing and uh, kind of jumped in, not knowing what to expect. And I got to tell you, I, there's a new art, new uh, writer on a must buy list now for me when your new books come out and I'm going to have to go pick up the other ones because I really really love your style um, it reminds me and I don't know, hopefully this is a compliment and not a and not a bash, but it reminds me a lot of Robert Parker with his Spencer books yep. where you kind of just jump in, you're, it's like I've known Hank my entire life and you're just in there with a, that inner monologue and I, I love it and um one, I guess maybe I'll, I'll throw one question because I know when I read Robert Parker books, uh, he is Spencer. I want to know how much of uh, Hank is you. Uh, uh, very little. Very little. Uh, there's, there's, um, uh, uh, you know, some biographical details. You know, the the you know the bartending in New York and the bar that he works in is is very very loosely based on you know and the people that that are in there are very loosely based on a bar that i work at in in new york uh things like the you know coming from a from kind of a rural town in california and uh, the way he gets to new york and uh you know a lot of those you know a lot of those places that he goes and the neighborhood that he lives in that's my old neighborhood, and you know a lot of a lot of those things are you know there's just those little details, the laundromat and the diner and everything. A lot of those just kind of day to day details are details from my life at the time that I was writing the book. It, uh, Hank is uh, uh, infinitely more capable than I am in a crisis. <laughs> uh, generally, generally, you know, uh, just kind of smarter, tougher, more compassionate. Uh, uh, you know, I, I couldn't even say that he's an idealized version of myself because I, I don't, you know, I don't come half as close uh, to to being uh, uh, to, to having his his uh, his positive traits and his negative traits. I have in spades, so um, not a whole lot. There, there was definitely an element with early in the book, with as he was initially exposed, being exposed to violence that he'd never experienced before where I was really trying to think very hard about how would I react to seeing something like that, what kind of impact would something like that being done to you have, have on you, and, you know, having no other model to use, using myself, you know, as, as you know, just trying to imagine what my reaction would be. But very rapidly after, you know, at a certain point with a book like that, where it's very action oriented, you know, things just spin so far away from your, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, if you, if you read it, led any kind of a normal life, which I have, uh, things get so far from your, you know, your actual experiences that trying to extrapolate from who you are to where that character is at that point becomes, you know, an exercise in futility and it just becomes much easier to, you know, just kind of let just let roll with the character, and at, at a certain point, the character. I was very fortunate with uh, with Hank that he took on a he took on a real uh, life of his own very early in the process, and and it was one of those you know cliches that writers talk about where you, I was able to kind of like 
just let him go and, and follow him around and write write his story as he went through it. Um, a, all 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 writing jobs should be that easy, because um, uh, and unfortunately they're not. Uh, but uh, but that one was uh, that one that one went really well. Well, guys, I got a roll. All right, Charlie. Um, well, thank you for being on the show. I appreciate you pleasure. taking the time for my pleasure coming on. And, and of course, we didn't get to all the things we'd like to, but you know, we can always pick up at another time. And... Well, you know what? I think the the thing to do. I think what would probably be most interesting is uh, to uh, do this again after after the first story arc comes out, after that sixth issue is out. And uh, we'll have more context, and, and you know, of course, by then you guys may just kind of be like, oh, "Fucking wait, we're having Charlie on this." Fucking show. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but but assuming you're still interested, uh, I'd love to talk to you guys again after the book is actually out. That would be a lot of fun. Great, cool. we look forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, take good, care, guys. Good, good luck. luck. Have a good night. Bye bye. So, well, I, I you know, I, after reading his novels. Uh, you know the the caught stealing and and six bad things. Um, it it feeds into and adds to the enthusiasm I had with him being on the book as a writer. I love his style. I like that kind of reading. It's almost to me I can equalize it to my level of enthusiasm when Frank Miller was on Daredevil. That's the kind of essence that I'm capturing from him. In the fact that it is kind of that street gritty type book, and he is bringing that into the character. On a, on a much more abrupt level, I should say, as from what we, I was used to with Munch and, and Sienkiewicz. So having him have that background and embracing that background and using it as a foundation to come from has made me enthused about him being on the book. But after reading his novels, it, it kind of helps into that because it, it, really, it really shows that how he can take that and make it bring it into present day and make the character interesting and broaden it for the universe as far as people, you know, the comic universe and, and people writing and reading. You should have read, um, you actually should have read Already Dead. As opposed to reason, reading those, you gave me Already Dead, which yeah. Already Dead is sort of the same. There's one character that you follow, and he's not a an official private investigator or whatever, but his role in the overall story of the vampires and all that mm-hmm. um, lends himself to that, but... Be, but Already Dead has all that that you're talking about and what Jamie talked about, but it also adds that... Um, that supernatural horror. I don't, want to, I, I don't want to say supernatural because he doesn't do it that way, but yes, that other level of the vampires and the strength right. and, and, and adventure like tale. Fantasy, you know, ex- fantasy yeah, aspect. Um, but he grounds that. He really... It's amazing. When I read it, I was surprised at how much he grounds even the virus itself that's inside these, these vampires into science and, and real life away from fantasy. Which is essential so, for the character. Because, exactly. So that's why I'm thinking you yeah. really should read that because that, now you're even going to get even closer to possibly what he's going to do with Moonlight. Right. Although I, I really think reading this is more along the lines of I, what I have always thought of Moonlight as being more of the, you know, the person, the one man against – because this you – know, Claude Stealing is one man against an army, basically, of people. He doesn't know what what they want from him, but they all act like he's supposed to know what he has. And it's just, like I said, I would love to see, I'm hoping he takes that inner monologue and just goes, runs with it through the comic, that you're really, you're inside Mark Spector's head and, you know, coming up against whatever he has to come up against. And like I said, reading this now, I'm a little more confident on going in, you know, a lot of times with some of the newer writers that Marvel brings up, I don't know their background, I don't know what they've written, and knowing now what I know and knowing that I'm going to go get all the rest of his books, I'm kind of actually looking forward to it now. And see, adding to that, which is what, I, you know, this, the actual solicitation that Marvel put out now for the first issue, which is appearing in uh, the first week of April, adds to what you're saying is to, it says, Mark Spector used to talk to God, he is God anyway, Khonshu, God of the Moon, God of Vengeance. Saved Spectre's life, brought him to glory, made him a hero, made him Moon Knight. But what Concho gives, he also takes away. And once he takes, he takes for good. Spectre learned this the hard way, spiraling into madness, depression, and worse. But he also remembers, remembers what it felt like to jump off the top of a six-story tenement, cloak spread behind him, remembers the feel of cartilage and bone exploding beneath his fists, remembers the fun stuff. Now Spectre wants back in the game. Will Concho hear his prayer? So when you read that and, and how he speaks, and if you read the novels, mm-hmm. you get that same element, that this is a, an, an inner turmoil and also a, a journey for this character. You know, that he's 
spiraling down, and hence the reason the, 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 <coughs> the miniseries originally t- t- titled The Bottom, is that he's going to hit bottom, and he's going to make a choice to come back. And so I think with his elements that he includes in his writing and the way he writes, mm-hmm. really feeds into this type of story and this direction of where he wants to take a character. So I'm very enthusiastic to to see where he goes with this and how it all unfolds and stuff. So, And now you're saying that about Already Dead. So just to recap, he has three novels out now. The first one is Caught Stealing. The second one is Six Bad Things. And the latest one, which just came out at the end of the year, is called Already Dead. Now, Caught Stealing and Six Bad Things are dealing with the same character, Hank Thompson. And that's a... There's one more in there's that? There's going to be another one out. I think it's called Dangerous Man is going to be the third one, which will be the final trilogy for that character at this point. And now this character, I think it's Joe Pitt. Joe Pitt is set up in Already Dead, and I think he has plans to continue this at least About for four one. or five. Yeah, so... Yeah, they're going to be called the Joe Pitt Case Books, and uh, they're they're interesting. So that's neat that he has that, you know, he's just, he's creating his own characters and writing about them, and he's sticking with them, not just mm-hmm. writing a novel, here's a character, you know, going at it. He I was, love series. I, I mean, know, I guess as the comic book reader in me, I want more and more and more of the same good thing, you know? It's like movies, you know? It's, as soon as you hear there's a sequel, oh, there's a sequel coming out? Yeah. Where if I, go? If I have to put any kind of comparison to this book and it's a total unfair comparison and it's and it's I'm going with the easiest things I can think of it's kind of like you know what the the mystery novels that you're talking about or the the not mystery novel the hard knock detective or the noir however you want it. The, yeah. the noir mixed with the kindred the vampire with uh-huh. the clans and all that yeah. and also a touch of matrix wow believe it or not <laughs> and he's probably screaming at me right now but there is I, maybe not Matrix. Maybe I should just say Neo. Okay, and that kind of gives you an idea. You know, if you can kind of follow his journey. So, and I know that may scare people away, but don't because it's that those are gross. Sounds interesting to me. Oh yeah. But um, that's kind of what I felt in the because I'm inexperienced as far as reading these kind of detective novels, yeah. and I've read some things of the Kindred. So, I mean, it, his novels read well. I mean, they're very. I mean, I I couldn't. When I first started reading Caught Stealing, I read like the first – it's not in chapters. It's in parts. And I started reading the beginning, and I was kind of like trying to get into it. And then I kind of put it down and then went back to it. But once I went back to it and got in, it just starts flowing. And you're just – it's like a wave. It catches you, and you just go right along for the ride. I think I read Caught Stealing in less than six hours, I mean in, in two sittings, because it just reads – it reads kind of quick, but it's not like it's – oh, there's nothing there. It's all sustenance, and it's all – it, it kept me reading because I wanted to know what was happening next. It's like, what's, how's this going to get out of this one? How's he going to, you know, just when like halfway through the novel, it's like, well, this could end right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's got a whole other half of the novel here yet. What's going on? And it just takes off. It just keeps going. So he doesn't have the same problem Bendis does with the uh, decompression. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> on that. Get out of my house. <laughs> I, I had to bring everything back. I'm going to take it someplace else. We don't have much long, uh, much time left in this episode, so we got to have one regular feature, at least. This one, Peter, is from Scott Cedarland. Uh, he was responding to your plead on the forum for more questions. Question number one, DC. Who is the Green Arrow-like member of the Inferior Five? Um, uh, um, Bowman. That's correct. <laughs> Blimp, dumb bunny. Um, the hell's that guy's name? All right, now I, you're I, just I, showing off. I know. Well, I had to go through it in my head because I couldn't think of it. Question number two, Marvel. Name the six gems on the Infinity Gauntlet. Uh, space, time, mind. The soul is the one that uh, what's-his-face has. Reality. Adam Warlock. Hmm? Adam, Warlock. Adam Warlock, yeah. Space, time, mind, soul, reality. Oh, power? Yes. Whew. Very good. <laughs> Question number three, independent. Here we go. Yeah, this is where I bring the quarter out. <laughs> In Queen and Country, who is the current ah. director of Ops? Ah. Basil save, Exposition. Save that no question idea. for another month. Yeah. I actually I actually could have answered this one. It's Paul Crocker. Because oh. he's in the novel that I'm reading. Uh, so. Very good. There you go. Almost a clean sweep. Yeah. Almost. Not bad. They're hitting my weak points. Yeah, but you've been doing pretty good lately. 
Some of those are. Uh, no, I'm not going to say anything because then I'm going to get Forget it. Forget yeah. it. Just take the compliment, will you? Yeah. I All right. Okay. Hey, I want to. Um, I have to give a big, big, big thanks to uh, Jeffrey Borchert, Icon on the forum. Oh, yeah. You know, he sent us the truffles for Christmas. <laughs> well, today I got a package from him. In it are three stamp books that they had sitting around the house. One of them is his grandfather's. Wow. One of them is his father's, and then one of them is his uncle's. His grandfather's stamp book is all stamps from before, like, 1932 or something is the date in the wow. book. Jesus. I mean, countries that don't exist anymore. I mean, this is old stuff. So... He said, you know, they've just been sitting around the house and they, they didn't know what to do with them, so he decided to send them to me. And I really, really appreciate it because there is some fantastic stuff in there. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And then I also got, earlier in the week, uh, I got two things. One, I got uh, Andy Roshengar from Skokie, Illinois. He sent me some stamps that he got from Iran. I guess he said his father has huh. family there and... Uh, Oh, he's LT Smash on the forum. Okay, okay. So uh, those are very cool because I, I don't believe I have any Iranian stamps, so that's great. And then I also got <laughs> more stamps. This one from Paul Lagozzino in Australia, and he sent me just a whole mess of stamps that uh, he had, wow. and uh, they're from all over the world. It's great. He says a stamp album he had from his childhood, so... Um, Wow. I'm loving this. I got. I have to spend so much time now with my stamps and getting it in order. Stamp geek speak now. Is yeah, apparently. <laughs> to the listeners, Philatetic. I collect one hundred dollar bills in U.S. currency. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that already. It hasn't worked. That's cool, Brian. That's really cool. That's awesome. That's so really I thank neat. everyone who's uh, been. And see, that's the thing that you know that I always try to like. You know, Charlie said, and what I've done too already is stuff is take things, and if you don't want them, give them to somebody who will appreciate them. Find a home for them because. Right. It means something to somebody, rather than just throw them away or trivialize them to someone or something like that. If somebody really appreciates it, I mean, it's something that means a lot more than just getting rid of it and giving it to somebody. So it just goes to show. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Michael D. at Most People Are DJs on his episode uh, for the um, best of 2005, which I think was his 25th episode. I'm not sure. He listed his best non-music podcast as Comic Geek Speak. So I wanted to give that little shout out cool. back to him. I Excellent. thought that was kind of cool. And um, last episode we talked about we did an off the rack, and I talked about Common Foe that Desperado Publishing, and I wasn't sure if it was a series or mini series. It is a mini series. It's a five issue mini series. Just in case anybody out there wanted to know. So are you going to finish that one off now? Um, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I have something else if you want. Okay. To just quick. Yeah. We have time? A little bit, bit of time. Um, because this episode is coming out um, on Thursday of this week, before the Sunday um, 100, 100 episode, the address, which we didn't have the last time, is 3050 North 5th Street Highway, Reading PA 19605 for the Fairground Square Mall, for those people who don't go to the forum. And that's also Route 222 that that highway is. And if business. Any, 222. Business, business 222. Yeah. Thank you. And if anybody wants to send... Audio comments, not necessarily through the phone line, because we're not going to know that they are episode 100 um, related. Uh, related. Um, what we'll do is after we record, we're going to edit them into the end of the episode. So if anybody wants to talk about CGS or whatever, once we're once that episode goes up a few days after we record, we can edit that stuff in at the end. So all, pretty much, and make sure you label episode 100. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess we better wrap it up. Yeah, cool. This episode was sponsored by Devil's Do, uh, how to self-publish comics, not just create them. And that will uh, that's going to be released in February. Devil's Do, reminding everyone that pop culture is our culture. And a big thanks to Charlie Houston for joining us and uh, explaining all his reasons. So maybe we won't start out hating the new Moon Knight series. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that in a good way. Yes, that's, because I inst- instead of having a, you know, a bad taste in our mouth, now it's cleared up, and now we understand where he's going. Whether we like it or not, we understand, and at least we know he put a lot of thought into it, right? And, and didn't just. Uh, and 
And like with anything else, go into it with an open mind, read it, and take it for what it is. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. All right. So if you'd like to send us an email, it's comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. And our website is comicgeekspeak.com. Big thanks to the guys at upallnightgaming.com for hosting our website. Uh, We ask, uh, please vote for us at Podcast Alley. And uh, if you want to get a t-shirt, we have some available on our website. Uh, As usual, we are brought to you in conjunction with worldfamouscomics.com, your spot on the internet for the best comic book and entertainment-related columns, contests, features, reviews, news resources, and more. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time.